It's okay to be weird, guys. It's okay to be different. I think uh, our kids kind of understand that. At least with the kids, the, 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 you know, when our kids are real little, they kind of say, they're, they're proud of being weird. They're proud of being different. I remember my kids used to uh, ask, you know, am I weird? And I'd say, yeah, you're a little weird. And they'd say, yes. And they, they liked the uniqueness of it. And I think we forget that as we grow up. We just, you know, we join the, the rat race. We just try to fit in somewhere in school. Uh, something, something in us dies, I think. That uniqueness of us that God created us with, it dies. And we try to just fit in with everyone else. Um, and we're so concerned about looking like everyone else and worried about what everyone thinks about us. Um, but it's okay to be weird. Uh, we should be weird, I think. Um, the world is getting darker and darker, and I don't think we should be concerned about fitting in with the world. If the world's getting going in the wrong direction, uh, we should look different. We should look unique. Um, one of the big problems with the church is Christians look just like the world. Nobody cares about church because nobody sees the point of it. They say, well, I'd rather sleep in on Sunday. I don't need something extra to do. Uh, you know, and they see that's all the church is because the church people look exactly like the world. So what's the big deal? Um, we shouldn't look more like the world. We should be looking less like the world. We ought to be strange. <laughs> we ought to be changing uh, now that we are living for Christ. Uh, if you are living for Christ, if you've given your life to him, um, you should be looking different. Uh, we're either looking more like the world or we're looking more like Jesus. Um, those are our two options. We're uh, looking through, we're, we're in a series called Rotten Fruit. And uh, we call it rotten fruit because the, the Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit, the good fruit that the Spirit wants to grow in us. But then there's also this, uh, this fruit that our flesh likes to grow in. It's this rotten fruit. And if you heard that phrase, that one bad apple spoils the bunch, I don't know if that, I think that is true. Whenever you get a, a rotten apple, it kind of tends to spoil the rest of them. And that's what the rotten fruit does in our life. The good things that the Spirit's trying to do, we get this rotten fruit that grows at the same time and it just kind of makes everything moldy and mushy, Ew, gross. Um, and there's a bunch of uh, lists of uh, things that we're to be staying away from, things that don't fit in with, uh, well, it fits in with the world just fine, but uh, the Apostle Paul says there's certain things that we do that don't fit in with the new life that Jesus has uh, paid for us for. And the verses we're looking at today is in Ephesians 5. We were in Ephesians 4 last week. We're going to continue right where we left off in Ephesians chapter 5. And if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and open those out. If you had a, you've got them on your smartphone, your iPad or whatever, go ahead and pull that out, uh, whatever works. Um, sometimes, actually a lot of the times, uh, we can only fit so many verses on that insert. And so I'll, I'll like to read a few more verses. And it's the same case today. Uh, you have 1 through 7 in your insert. I'm going to read all the way through to verse 10. So if you have your Bibles, it might be easier to follow along with that. But feel free to bring your Bibles, obviously, to church. Hopefully nobody feels, hopefully nobody feels uncomfortable bringing their Bible to church. Uh, but whatever you need to do uh, to follow along. Now, this is, uh, the verses we're reading are in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 through 10. And Paul says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these things are improper for God's people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, person such person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, because of these rotten fruits, the God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Here's verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, I would pray, just echo again the, uh, the words that were already spoken, the words that we've been singing and uh, reenacting in the Last Supper. Lord, our hearts are open to you. Lord, we, uh, we just dedicate our, this time to you and we open up our hearts and our minds to you to speak to us what is true. And we ask that you would do that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going through, like I said, looking at some of these lists of sins, 
uh, in the Bible, and it can be very convicting. I know it's even convicting for me as I'm preparing these messages. And I said, like I said last week, I appreciate everyone coming back uh, week after week to hear more convicting words. Uh, but that's good. That's what we want. We lo- we want to open up our hearts and say, God, we need to change. We we recognize we don't want to stay the same. So where in our lives do you want us to change? And um, sometimes the Holy Spirit will press on that thing, and you'll feel this burning sensation. You'll think, Gosh, that. Did the pastor, did he think, did he think of me as he's writing this sermon? Um, people have been asking me that uh, every week, and it's not. No, I, all I have to do really is look into my own heart, and I just need to really write it for me. Um, and, uh, and, it's, and it's convicting. Whatever's convicting for me, I figure works, works well, because other people are the same usually as me. Um, well, as we're going through these lists of sins, the one we're looking at today, he's got a few in there, but we're going to be concentrating on verse 4 today where Paul says there should be no uh, obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. So this is what we're going to concentrate on. This is what Paul says, um, along with all these other things that we looked at, pride, uh, lust, all these things, uh, Paul seems to think that speech is very important. Not just Paul, uh, but God seems to think our speech is pretty important. Now, Paul doesn't list out the exact words we aren't supposed to say. He doesn't say, hey, by the way, don't say these specific words. These are, you know, cuss words or whatever. Uh, He gives, he lays out principles. Uh, He lays out kind of the the groundwork. And we're supposed to take these principles to God, to the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to open up our hearts and say, now, where, where is my life not fitting in line with this? Paul says, no obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking. Uh, And we're supposed to say, okay, how does that apply to me? Um, The principle that Paul uses in every single one of these lists that we looked at is the same thing that I keep saying over and over again each week. Um, And that is, be what you are. God has rescued you out of darkness, and he's made you children of light, so now you should be living as children of light. He's, He's simply saying, be what you are. Be who God called you to be. Um, listen to verse 8 again. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. He's saying, now that God has already done this, this is your response, is to live, as that, live out the life that God has bought you uh, for. Um, he doesn't say, clean up your act, and then you will be made righteous, and then God will save you. He doesn't say, do all these things, cut out the swear words, and then God will accept you. He says, God has already accepted you, already forgiven you. Now be what you are. He's adopted you as his child. Now live out that life as his child. That's such an important thing. And you may be sick. I I want you to be sick of me saying, be what you are, because that really encapsulates uh, the gospel, that God rescued us while we were still sinners. But now that we're rescued, we should live different lives. Um, You were dark, now you are light, so live as children of light. Now this affects uh, not only all of us, it affects every part of us. Um, Paul has been talking about all sorts of parts of our lives, and now he wants to talk about our speech. And he's basically saying, vulgar speech is out of place among Christ followers. It doesn't have any place, really, for uh, Christians. Why? Because he wants us to be goody two-shoes. He wants us to be better than everyone else. He wants us to uh, be holier than thou. Uh, No, it's simple. He's saying, you're not a part of the dark anymore. So since you're not a part of the dark anymore, uh, quit speaking like the people who live in the darkness do. That's the reason. Um, And I think this is one of our big problems um, in the church and, and throughout in the culture is that we don't take sin seriously. We, we have things that we really like to care about, but um, the question is, well, the question isn't, well, what do I think about this? The question is, should be, uh, well, what does God think about this stuff? Um, people are always ask me about uh, homosexuality. Is homosexuality sin? What do you think about homosexuality? And I, I, I'm almost always say, what does it matter what I think about homosexuality? I'm concerned what God thinks about it. Just same way with everything. What do you think about speech? Is vulgar speech? What do you think? Is that a sin? Who cares what I think? I want to know what God thinks, and I want to line my life up with that. Um, We laugh and we think, well, who cares about speech? Everybody kind of says this stuff. Everybody slips up. And so we hardly think, since it's not important to us, we hardly think that it's important to God. Or maybe we're just embarrassed. We'd rather fit in. It's much easier to fit in with the darkness, uh, uh, talking like darkness. But Paul says, well, wait a second. You're not supposed to be darkness anymore. Meanwhile, God is saying to us, you know, I don't want you to fit in. I want you to look different. I want you to look strange. It's good to look strange 
to a strange world. <laughs> um, and darkness includes what we think, it includes how we act, and it even includes what we say. Um, God says, I care about this stuff. I care about this nitty-gritty stuff the way a parent would care about their child going in the wrong direction. The child might not think it's any big deal. It thinks, well, I just want to fit in. I want to do all these things. So the parent sees in their heart and their heart breaks. Oh, I wish they wouldn't be going down this path. God is the same way. He cares about these things because he doesn't want to see us going down the wrong path. So whether you, you think it matters or not, God seems to care. Um, Paul lists out all these thins, sins, and he says, make no mistake, in verse 6 and 7, he says, don't let anyone deceive you. Uh, these deeds of darkness, this rotten fruit, this is this, exactly the reason that God's wrath is coming. Um, he doesn't say, you know, if you slip up, you'll be uh, in danger of God's wrath. He says, God has already rescued us. God has set us in place firmly in Christ. But he says, those actions um, that we were living in, that, li that old life that we were living, um, God's wrath is coming because of those things. It's not no big deal. It's not, oh, who cares about sin? Um, God's wrath is real. Um, we aren't in danger of, of it if we're in Christ. But now that we are in Christ, well, don't live in those things anymore. Vulgar speech is out of place. He gets right down to the nitty-gritty, right down to our, uh, the words we, that come out of our mouth. And he mentions three types of speech in verse 4. He says, uh, obscenity, use the word obscenity, foolish talk, and coarse joking. Kind of the three types of speech that he mentions in this list. Now, the first one, obscenity, real quick, just what these words mean, um, because he doesn't use the English words. Paul uses, Paul is writing Greek, and we've translated it in English. Um, the first word uh, is translated into obscenity, and it carries the idea of just filthy language. And we understand filthy language. Um, one of the reasons I think uh, Paul doesn't give a list of words, hey, here's specific words that I don't want you to say, is because words change from culture to culture. Uh, some words are uh, acceptable one year, and then the next year, all of a sudden, they're bad words. You're not supposed to say those words anymore. And even from language to language, there's swear words in certain language, and then there's vulgar words that are, you know, I, I could say all sorts of vulgar words in another language, and nobody would have any clue what I'm talking about. Uh, Paul doesn't give a list of words you aren't supposed to say. He just says, stay away from this filthy language. Um, the second word uh, he uses, we translate foolish talk. This one's a little harder to understand, the, the Greek word, um, where the first word obscenity has to do with the filthy language, the vulgar, the words you're not supposed to use, or the words you should stay away from. Foolish talk has the idea that, um, uh, well, it's not like, an ig like dumb or ignorant talk, like you just don't know what you're talking about. Everybody says things they don't really know what they're talking about. But the word in Greek is... Uh, it's called morologia. That's the word. And we, it's the words that we use for moron and word. Moron speak. Stay away from moron speak, he says. Um, and it's the idea that it's kind of the, the stupid, careless things that we say. Um, when we use our language to degrade things. So it's not so much the, the actual words, like obscenity would be, but the way we talk about things, the foolish talk. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 23, uh, he uses the same word. He says, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. You ever see foolish and stupid arguments? You ever get on a line? <laughs> you can hardly get on a line without seeing a foolish or stupid argument. He says, don't have anything to do with foolish or stupid arguments. Same word. Don't have anything to do with moron speech, morologia, uh, because you know they produce quarrels. And isn't that right? We didn't, <laughs> I mean, that's almost very obvious. It's amazing that Paul, 2,000 years ago, would be able to define the internet so well. Uh, Foolish and stupid arguments that produce quarrels. Paul says, stay away from that stuff. Uh, the foolish talk, the stupid things we say. Uh, in the ancient world, they would use this word for the things that a drunk person speaks, the things that they say. That's morologia, foolish talk. Uh, the third thing is coarse joking. So obscenity, the vulgar words, the foolish talk, the moron speak, and then coarse joking. Stay away from this. And coarse joking isn't just bad jokes. If, if that, I would be in big trouble if, if, that, was a, if that was a restriction. Uh, but, you know, dirty jokes. Everybody kind of knows what dirty jokes are. You know, poop, poop jokes, sex jokes, that kind of stuff. Um, it really, they're kind of the lowest form of joking. When you were a kid, when you were a baby, your very first joke was, um, uh, that was your first joke. It's just the lowest form of, of joke. Uh, Paul says, uh, 
<laughs> and if you go to elementary school, you'll hear just variations of that same joke. And even as you grow, there's adults that have just that same basic joke. Um, you know, they're, they're raunchy. Uh, don't, don't be proud of those kind of jokes. That's the, lowest, <laughs> that's the lowest form of humor. Babies have those kind of jokes. Uh, stay away from the coarse joking. Uh, poop jokes, sex jokes, that kind of stuff. So in summary, we've got three areas here that Paul warns us about. Our language, the words we use, uh, our talk, the, the meaning of our words, what our words are doing, the, the, the grading things that our words can do, and our joking, uh, coarse joking. He says these things are out of place. And we ask, well, why are they out of place? Um, and I, like I say before, apparently God thinks that our words are important. He doesn't want us to be careless about just the things that come out of our mouth. We have this phrase. I don't know who came up with this phrase, but it's totally wrong. Uh, Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. You, everybody knows this phrase. What a silly, dumb phrase that is. Words are deeply, deeply hurting. Uh, Sticks and stone. I'll take sticks and stones any day to uh, words that they, I mean, don't words cut so deep? Um, God, said, God seems to think words are important. We have a culture that thinks, hey, who cares? But God says, no, they're very extremely important. In fact, Jesus is called the word of God. He is called the word. And the word, uh, it says in the Bible, is God. Uh, the, the idea is that the words of God are part of who God is. The words we speak, I think, are the same way. It's part of who we are. So God says, just, you know, be careful about the stuff that's coming out of your mouth. That's part of who you are. Um, that makes you part of who you are. Um, and we can bring th things down with our words. We can degrade things with our words. Uh, and we can certainly degrade ourselves by the things that come out of our mouth. Um, and we can degrade all sorts of things. God says, you might not care about what you're saying. Um, you might not care about you, but I care about you. You might not care about what your words do, but I care about what your words do. Um, and this is exactly how the darkness works. Uh, the darkness says, you know, nothing is sacred. Uh, nothing, is, nothing is out of bounds. Uh, we need to be, uh, but we need to be careful with that attitude of our culture that, you know, nothing is sacred and everything's open game. Um, it doesn't mean we can't joke. Uh, humor is great. Humor is hugely important, I think. Um, and Jesus joked around. Sometimes you would say a joke or two. And uh, God, well, I was just talking with uh, Pastor Ralph, and uh, he pointed out the duck bill platypus is a good sign that God has a sense of humor. And it's true. It's how ridiculous this thing is. And while God invented the duck bill platypus, obviously he has a sense of humor. Um, laughter is great. I think we could use with more laughter. Laughter is like medicine. You ever, I mean, uh, hearing a baby laugh, give them belly laugh. It's the greatest thing in the world. I should have had a video of it here. Uh, we could do with more laughter, more humor, especially in the church. Church uh, sometimes can be just too serious, you know, too dour, and, you know, we don't do that here. Um, laughter is great. Humor is great. Uh, but coarse joking is something different. Coarse joking, uh, it doesn't mean there's certain things you can never joke about. It just means be careful the way you're joking. Uh, make sure your joking isn't profaning something that's sacred. Uh, make sure your joking isn't cutting down something that's not supposed to be cut down. Remember, like Paul says, you're light, not darkness anymore. Because um, joking does have a, there's a power in joking. There's a power in humor. And there's a power to really uh, cut things down with it, like I said. Um, but be careful what you're cutting down with your jokes. Some things need to be cut down. Some things are, you know, prideful. and They need to be cut down. Um, but be careful what you do with your joke. And another thing about coarse joking is that um, jokes are memorable. Jokes are, jokes are funny. Even coarse joking, uh, even bad jokes are funny. You can hardly help to laugh at them sometimes. Um, but the issue is jokes uh, stick in people's heads. Um, I've got all sorts of terrible, bad jokes in my head that are there. I don't want them there, but they're there. I've heard them, I've, I've laughed at them, and they're there. Um, when you say, when you um, share a coarse joke, when you uh, keep spreading it, you might think it's funny, but you're, you're putting things in other people's heads they might not want to be there. Um, and I don't think that's fair. Um, like I say, I got all these sorts of jokes in my head that are there. They're stuck there. I can't, it's like, not like I can get rid of them. Um, the people with, that you're joking with, they might not want your junk in their heads. So be careful about what you're putting in people's heads. Uh, because jokes especially are just so, they get stuck in there. They're memorable. And uh, it's not like they're not funny. They are funny. And that's, the, that's 
the problem with them. Um, ultimately, the reason Paul says these things are out of place, though, is verse 8. And it's the thing we, we keep looking at over and over again. He says, you were once in darkness, but now you're in light. Live as children of light. Um, this is the principle here, and that's the same thing. You were rescued from darkness by Jesus, so stop living in the darkness. Stop doing the same things that you used to do. In essence, he's saying, like I say over and over again, be what you are. You are light in the Lord, so be light. And this, this difference is the difference between, um, this is a quick uh, theology lesson for you. It's the difference between what theologians call justification and sanctification. Justification is the word that we use for salvation. Um, when you give your life to Jesus, when you accept Jesus as Lord, when you accept him into your heart, uh, the Bible says you are justified. You are made right with God. You, and this happens while we were still sinners. I have a little graph of it there if it's, if it's on the uh, screen. While we were still sinners, uh, God rescued us and he justified us. And the word justified means it's just as if we hadn't sinned. God makes us just as if we hadn't sinned. That's our justification. Now, there's another word called sanctification. That means that's our life after we've given our hearts to Christ. That's our growth process as we grow to God up to the moment of our death or when God comes back, whichever comes first. Uh, we're living in this process of sanctification, growing more like God. And this is the principle that Paul says. You were rescued, you were darkness, now you're light, so now live as children of light. Now we're in the sanctification process. Unless you're sitting here and you have not been justified, you have not given your life to Christ, uh, you can do that at any moment. That doesn't take any work. It doesn't take anything. It just takes you uh, giving your life to Jesus, saying, Jesus, I, I need you to forgive me for my sins. Uh, I recognize that I'm sinful. Thank you for the price that you paid on my behalf, the, the work that you did on the cross for me. And uh, Jesus, I invite you into my heart. I accept you as my Lord. That's done. That's justification. Now we're supposed to be living as children of light. That's sanctification. And the Nazarene church, uh, all churches that believe in this sanctification, uh, the Nazarene church really likes to emphasize sanctification um, uh, because that's what the Bible does. And we say we want you to be entirely sanctified. We want not just parts of your life to be for God, but your whole life to be for God. Your whole person, your entire person needs to be uh, growing closer to God, more like him. Um, but that sanctification needs to be a desire. We have to have a desire to be more like Christ. We have to have a desire for what we call holiness. Uh, so how do we address this issue of, um, of vulgar speech? Because Paul says, um, this stuff, this vulgar speech, it's out of place. Um, he says there shouldn't be even a hint of it. It's improper. And when he says it's out of place, he means it's out of place in you. You are, you have the light of the Lord in you. This stuff that's coming out of your mouth, that's out of place in you. It shouldn't go, uh, it doesn't fit in your new life. It was fine in the darkness. Sure, darkness doesn't care about all that stuff. Darkness loves obscenity and foolish talk and coarse joking. Um, it's out of place in you though now. Um, so how do we address this issue of vulgar speech? Um, well, one thing, we have, to, we have to concentrate on the problem. You ever, when you were a kid and you said something, um, this was in the movie Toy Story, or not Toy Story, Christmas Story. This uh, little Ralphie said, uh, he said, the mother of all swear words or something, or the queen of all swear words. And his punishment was he had a bar of soap stuck in his mouth. Yeah, I don't know if you, get, you guys have ever had that happen to you, get the bar of soap in your mouth. Now, the problem with the bar of soap in your mouth is, it's an interesting punishment, but it doesn't actually clean anything. Uh, it, it, uh, it doesn't actually clean up the words that are coming out of your mouth. Does that make sense? Um, and I think a lot of times we focus on the wrong uh, issue. We try to clean up the wrong thing. Um, and this is the interesting part about uh, our speech is that cleaning up our speech doesn't really solve the problem because the, the, the words themselves aren't the issue. There's, a, there's a, a deeper issue going on. And sometimes I think we Christians can get into the problem of, well, um, okay, I'm going to force myself to say uh, different things. So instead of the queen of all swear words, now I say this different word. Um, it, meanwhile, the same thing's going on in our hearts that causing us to say these things. There's a, there's a ridiculous... Uh, it's become a tradition, but there's a Christian radio station, Smile FM, and every morning they have the clean joke of the day. And I, I hate the clean joke of the day. I think it's terrible. It's so cheesy. Uh, 
they, they just say the worst jokes, and I think, oh my goodness, this, this isn't what Christians should be known for, just awful, cheesy jokes. Our kids really like them, I think, but uh, I, I secretly can't stand them. Um, but I don't think that's the solution. Is n- now, instead of coarse jokes, just say really cheesy jokes. Oh, pr- I, I pray that we're not known for <laughs> cheesy jokes as Christians. Uh, the solution is not to be cheesy, not to just f- change uh, the words around. Um, if, the, if, if the issue is in our mouth, though, if the, issue, if, if the issue is in our speech, ultimately, what is it? Well, Jesus says something interesting in Luke chapter 6. He says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. And he says, and he's actually quoting the Old Testament here, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Whatever is in your heart, your mouth mouth doesn't have a mind of its own. It's just doing whatever is already in your heart. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Speech is not a mouth issue. Speech is a heart issue. There's something going on in our heart that needs to be done. There's a work in our heart that needs to take place. Um, Ultimately, the work that needs to be done, like I say, is in our heart. Um, There's things we can do to curb it. There's things we can do to stop the speech. But ultimately, what we need is a cleansing from God. We need an inner cleansing of the heart. Um, And that's good news because the heart is ultimately what the Holy Spirit, uh, what God is interested in cleaning over anything else. Uh, He wants a new heart to be given to us. Uh, God says, I don't want you to be selfish with your heart. I don't want you to try to fix your heart yourself. Uh, That's my job. That's what I love doing. Um, Stop thinking that you have the power to fix the problem just by stopping the words that come out of your mouth. He says, I have the power to clean your heart, to make you, give you a new heart. And that's ultimately what we need and what we want. We want to get new hearts, have a new life, so we have good that comes out of our mouth that just overflows from our good hearts. Not having to constantly stop the evil things coming out of our mouth because our heart is just overwhelming or overflowing with bad things. So the speech, our speech is ultimately a heart issue. It's not a mouth issue. Um, As I'm preparing for sermons, uh, and this may seem counterintuitive, but the most important part of my sermon prep is not the words that I'm writing down, but my own heart. I need to prepare. This is the most important thing, and I've, I've found this out, is not just, um, not the words, not the studying. Uh, the most important thing is preparing my own heart. Uh, not just in prayer, but my lifestyle. The most important part of my sermon is what I'm doing throughout the week, how I'm living my life. Uh, my, my Bible reading, my prayer, my, my devotions, my relationship with God. That's the most important part of my sermon. Studying is important. Uh, you know, putting everything together is important and finding illustrations and all the things, putting it a, getting it a coherent whole, that's important. Um, but at the end of the day, you don't want me just saying what I think is a good thing to say. Uh, you don't want me saying just the words that I've prepared. You don't want that. I pray that you don't want that. Um, I need to prepare ultimately myself. I need to prepare my heart. Before I say anything, I need to make extra sure that I have uh, soaked myself in God's light and his love. Um, And now that's well and good for me. Obviously, I'm a pastor, and you you kind of expect, well, that's, yeah, pastors should do that kind of stuff. But it also applies to you. And the th- whatever your job is, this just happens to be my job, and this just happens to be my job includes speaking things. Uh, but it also applies to you, whatever you have, uh, whatever your life uh, story is about. Um, the most important part about you is your heart and your soul, the, and that part needs to be tended to. We're so worried about the, all these surface things. We're so worried about the, you know, the assignment that's due or the, the meeting that needs to take place or the phone call or the bills that need to be paid, all these surface things. Don't forget the most important part about you needs to be tended to first and foremost. If you're not soaking yourself in God's light throughout the week, I'm not talking about just coming to church once a week. That's a good start. Um, but soaking yourself in God's light throughout the week, you're continually living in darkness. And you're still light. God saved you if you are, uh, in fact, saved. Um, But you're going out and living in darkness and never soaking yourself in the light. And that is not going to produce anything good. Um, You need to prepare your hearts 
before that meeting takes place, before that tough assignment, um, before uh, you, you know, just go throughout your day, you need to be prepared for the day. You need to be soaking yourself in God's light. And I think we need to be, we need to stop rushing so fast to everything. Um, before you do anything in the day, before you do anything important in the day, make sure you've asked yourself, you know, have I soaked myself in God's light? Have I, uh, maybe I should have used a different illustration than soaked, but that's just what came to my mind. Have I, uh, basked in God's light, or am I just going in my own strength? Um, it's got to be a part of our lifestyle. I got this from uh, Joyce Meyer a, a little while ago. She said, and I've uh, started making it a habit in my own life, uh, as she rolls out of bed in the morning, she gets right on her knees, and she says, God, prepare me. Uh, prepare my heart for this day, prepare me for the things that I need to do, and prepare me for the things that I don't know I need to do, but that are still coming around the corner. And uh, I try to make that part of my uh, just daily routine. As I roll out of bed, I, you just literally roll right out of bed, boom, and you're right there. You can do it. That's a great start to your day. Before you pick up your phone, before you check your email or your Facebook or whoever texted you, before you do anything, make sure you've at least soaked yourself in, or basked in the light. I don't know where I came up with the soaked idea, but uh, that's what I always think, I guess, in my head, is I need to soak myself first. Um, just like my sermon, that's the most important part about your life. That's the most important thing you can do with your life. You say, well, I got big things going on. I got a lot of stuff to do. You know, I'm a, I tend to sleep in, and as soon as I realize I'm late, I need to go. <laughs> um, I don't have time to soak myself. Well, um, to God, you know, you're, you are infinitely more important than whatever it is you're rushing around trying to accomplish. You are more important to God than whatever it is you're running around trying to do. And uh, God cares more about the status of your soul than he cares about anything you can think. He, he cares more about your soul than he does the whole nation. Um, in the Old Testament, God says to the Israelites over and over again, come to me. And the Israelites say, we care so much about our country, our nation, and uh, we have to do all these things, and we have to make deals with other nations. And God says, yeah, I want you guys to care about me. I care about your soul. And ultimately, God says, I'm going to let this whole nation fall to pieces just, because, just so you'll stop focusing on it and start turning back to me. And when we start when we in our own lives just concentrate on all these surface things, God says, you're concentrating on the wrong things. And I think we need to be careful. If we don't take care of our soul, God may, um, in his grace, take away those things that are distracting us, take away those things that we get so worried about just so that we can start concentrating on our soul. And uh, we don't want him to do that, but God, in his grace, do you understand that? In his grace, he'll take those things away so they'll stop being a distraction for you. Uh, let's uh, give him the first fruits of our day, the first fruits of our time. By all means, be prepared with whatever you have to do, but prepare your heart first and foremost. Um, I remember talking when I, when I first started about uh, uh, preparing sermons and doing all this stuff, and I'd taken classes and was talking to my mentor about, you know, how long should a sermon be? How do you know you're going to hit the right time? I'm always worried about I'm going to go way over or I don't have enough. Um, and, uh, you know, how many illustrations should you use? And should you tell how many stories? And uh, should I have three points, like a three-point sermon? And he says, um, yeah, that stuff's, you know, kind of important. But preparing yourself, preparing your message is nothing to preparing your heart. He goes, if you're not prayed up, if you're not, if you're not living right, then none of that stuff matters. God's, and I think God uh, is saying up there, you know, Chad, I don't even want to hear your words if you just do it out of your own strength and your own pride. I'm not even really interested in that. Um, and he says the same thing to us when he's not even really interested in the words we say unless we've um, properly uh, prepared our hearts first. So what do we do then about our speech? Um, how do we know what is appropriate and what is inappropriate? Um, and I think we remember the principle. We are light and we're not darkness anymore. And since we are light, we're supposed to bring light, not darkness. We're supposed to spread light, not spread darkness. Um, we need to ask yourself, when is my speech light and when is it darkness? Um, Paul says in verse 4, instead of these three things, instead of obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, Paul says uh, those things are out of place, but rather speak thanksgiving. And I thought that was weird. Why is thanksgiving the opposite of these, you know, vulgar speech? Because uh, Paul doesn't say 
only say serious, uh, dour things. Uh, never, never be frivolent. He doesn't say that. He says, instead of those things, speak thanksgiving. And I think what Paul is trying to say is, uh, he's trying to reorient our thinking on what speech does. Because the opposite of thanksgiving is being flippant and uncaring. Um, something good is happening, you're not thankful for it, you just don't care about it. Or you trash something good instead of being thankful for what it is. And I think this is why the thanksgiving is the opposite of this vulgar speech. Um, watch out that your speech isn't given in thanksgiving when it's just flippant and uncaring and uh, when you're trashing something that's good. Um, like I said, he doesn't give us a list of examples. He just wants us to figure it out. He says in verse 10, uh, you are children of light. Now find out what pleases the Lord. Well, how do we find out what pleases the Lord? Uh, I want to share with you a verse in Romans 12 that talks exactly about how to find out what pleases the Lord. Paul says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Don't be transformed by the world. Trans be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And with that renewed mind, you'll be able to test and see what God wants you to do in your own life. But that's what we need to do. We need to renew our mind daily. And then you'll be able to test. Um, that's why it's so important to be soaking yourself in God's light, to renewing yourself in God's light and in his love so that you can test in your own life what is good and perfect and pleasing will is. I'm going to wrap it up here and just ask, um, are you re renewing your mind daily? Are you renewing yourself in the light of the Lord? Or are you just going out right away into the darkness? Um, it's going to take an intentional work uh, from us as followers of Christ to not keep living like the world. Um, if you keep putting darkness into your heart, what's going to eventually happen is darkness is going to start coming out of your mouth. You're going to be talking before long. Something will slip out and you'll think, ooh, shoot, uh, I've been putting garbage in my heart all this time and now it's coming out. Um, if you accepted Jesus as Lord, then God has brought you out of the darkness and into light. And stronger still, he, just does, he doesn't just say God's brought you into light. He says, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. You were not just in the darkness, you were darkness, and now you are light in the Lord. We're carriers of God's light. Our presence brings his light. Our speech should bring his light. We have a mission and a calling as a church. Um, we're carrying God's blessing with us, so we need to bless others. We need to pray for others. We need to care for them. When we interact with people, we should be leaving people better than when we met them, uh, than when we found them, not worse. We should be using our speech to, uh, speech to spread the light of God in this dark world and don't add to the darkness. As I finish up, uh, the team's gonna um, lead us in worship and I just would like our, just a, just a final act of, as we sing along, just be thinking, this is my speech that I'm using to praise the Lord with. God, you gave me this speech and I wanna give it back to you. And Paul ends this section with these words. He says, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Lord, I just, um, I'm, we're just thankful. We want to keep that spirit of thanks that you have given us breath. You have given us life. You have given us new life. You've given us words to speak, Lord. I pray that we would use all these things for you. Pray that we use all these things for your kingdom. Lord, those areas of our life where we just are still living for ourselves, that we haven't subjected them to you, Lord, I pray for your, just your sanctifying grace today, that your grace would come in and sanctify us entirely, that our whole lives, our speech, uh, our words, our heart, everything would come under your lordship. Lord, I'm thankful that you've rescued us out of the kingdom of darkness. I'm thankful that everyone here who's called on the name of the Lord, that we don't have to worry about the darkness, that you've taken care of that, Lord, that we just have to worry about what we have surrendered to you. And so, Lord, we surrender all things to you today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.